Hello, everyone. Welcome to Empower English Readers. Our story is The Adventure of the Noble Bachelor by Arthur Conan Doyle. The Lord St. Simon Wedding and its strange end are not interesting to people in high society anymore. New scandals have made people forget it, and they talk about other things now. But I think the full story has never been told to everyone, and my friend Sherlock Holmes helped solve the mystery, so I want to tell you about it in this story of him. A few weeks before I got married, I was still living with Holmes in Baker Street. One day he came back from a walk and found a letter waiting for him. I had stayed home all day because it was raining and windy. My leg hurt from a bullet I got in a war in Afghanistan. I was sitting in a chair with my legs on another chair and reading newspapers. I had read so much news that I was tired of it, so I looked at the letter on the table and wondered who wrote it to Holmes. I see a very fancy letter, I said when he came in. Your morning letters were from a fish seller and another worker. Yes, my letters are always different, he answered, smiling. And the less important ones are usually more interesting. This one looks like an invitation to a boring event or a lie. He opened the letter and read it quickly. But it might be interesting after all. Not a party invitation. No, it's about work. From a rich person? One of the richest in England. I'm happy for you. Thank you, Watson. But I care more about the case than the person. But this case might be interesting too. Have you been reading the news a lot lately? It seems so, I said, pointing to a big pile of newspapers in the corner. I had nothing else to do. That's good, because you can help me. I only read the crime news and personal ads. The personal aides can teach me things. But if you've been reading the news, you must know about Lord St. Simon and his wedding. Yes, I read it with great interest. Good. This letter is from Lord St. Simon. I'll read it to you, and you can look at these papers and find anything about the case. Here's what he wrote. Dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, Lord Backwater says I can trust your judgment and that you will be discreet. I have decided to ask for your help with a very sad event related to my wedding. Mr. Lestrade from Scotland Yard is working on it, but he thinks you can help too. I will come to see you at four o'clock in the afternoon. If you have other plans, please change them, because this is very important. Yours sincerely, Robert St. Simon. The letter is from Grosvenor Mansions, written with a feather pen, and the rich man accidentally got ink on the side of his right little finger, said Holmes as he closed the letter. He says four o'clock. It's three now. He will come in an hour. So, we have some time to learn about this case. Please look at those papers and put the information in the right order, while I see who our client is. He took a red book from a shelf near the fireplace. Here he is, he said, sitting down and opening the book. Lord Robert St. Simon, the second son of the Duke of Balmoral, born in 1846. He's 41 years old, which is a good age to get married. He worked for the government before. His father was also in the government. Their family has a long history. But this doesn't tell us much. I need you to tell me more, Watson. I found what I need easily, I said, because the story is new and interesting, but I didn't want to bother you because you were working on another case. You mean the furniture van problem? I solved that already. It was easy. Now, tell me what you found in the newspapers. Here's the first thing I found. It's in the personal ads in the morning post from a few weeks ago. A wedding is planned and will happen soon between Lord Robert St. Simon, second son of the Duke of Balmoral, and Miss Hattie Doran. 
the only daughter of Aloysius Doran from San Francisco, California, USA. That's all. Short and clear, said Holmes, stretching his long legs near the fire. There was more information in a society paper that week. Here it is. British men may need protection in marriage because American women are marrying them and taking over their homes. Another important man, Lord St. Simon, will marry Miss Hattie Doran, the beautiful daughter of a rich man from California. Miss Doran, who looked lovely at a recent party, is an only child, and her money will be a lot. The Duke of Balmoral had to sell some things in the last few years, and Lord St. Simon doesn't have much of his own. So the American woman will also gain from the marriage. Is there anything else? Asked Holmes, yawning. Oh, yes, there's more. The Morning Post said the wedding would be very quiet at St. George's, Hanover Square. Only a few close friends were invited, and they would go to a rented house at Lancaster Gate afterward. Two days later, it was announced that the wedding happened and the honeymoon would be at Lord Backwater's place. These are all the news before the bride went missing. Before the what? Asked Holmes, surprised. The bride disappeared. When did she disappear? At the wedding breakfast. Interesting. This is more exciting than I thought. Yes, it's quite unusual. Brides sometimes disappear before the wedding or during the honeymoon, but this is very fast. Tell me what happened. I must warn you, the details are not complete. Maybe we can make them clearer. There's an article in a newspaper from yesterday that tells the story. It's called Strange Event at a Fashionable Wedding. Lord Robertson Simon's family is very upset about the strange and sad things that happened at his wedding. The wedding was the day before, but now people are talking about the strange rumors. The friends tried to keep it quiet, but now everyone is talking about it, so there's no reason to pretend. It didn't happen. The wedding at St. George's Hanover Square was quiet. Only the bride's father, Mr. Aloysius Duran, some important people, and the bridegroom's brother and sister were there. After the wedding, they went to Mr. Doran's rented house for breakfast. A woman, whose name is unknown, tried to get into the house, saying she had some right to Lord St. Simon. The butler and a servant had to force her to leave. The bride had gone into the house before this happened and sat down for breakfast. Then she said she felt sick and went to her room. When she didn't come back for a long time, her father went to look for her. Her maid said the bride had come into her room quickly, grabbed a coat and hat, and ran downstairs. A servant said he saw a lady leave the house dressed like that, but didn't think it was the bride because he thought she was with the guests. When they found out the bride was gone, Mr. Doran and the bridegroom contacted the police. They are trying to find out what happened. Until late last night, no one knew where the missing bride was. Some people think something bad happened, and the police have arrested the woman who caused trouble earlier, thinking she might be involved in the bride's disappearance. Is that all? There is one more thing in another morning paper. It's interesting. What is it? Miss Flora Miller, the woman who caused the disturbance, has been arrested. She used to be a dancer at the Allegro and has known the bridegroom for some years. That's all the information, and now the case is in your hands. It looks very interesting. I wouldn't want to miss it. But the bell is ringing, Watson, and since it's a little after four, I think our important client is here. Don't leave, Watson. I like having a witness to help me remember things. Lord Roberts and Simon the page, boy said, opening the door. A man with a nice face and a high nose walked in. He looked a bit annoyed, but also confident. 
He seemed older than he was because he walked with a slight stoop. His hair was turning grey, and he was dressed very carefully. He held a cord with gold eyeglasses in his right hand. Hello, Lord San Simon, Holmes said, standing up and bowing. Please sit in this chair. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. Come closer to the fire, and we'll talk about the problem. It's very painful for me, Mr. Holmes. I am very upset. I know you have helped with other cases like this, but they were probably not with people like me. No, I am working with someone less important now. I'm sorry. My last client like this was a king. Really? I didn't know. Which king? The king of Scandinavia. Did he lose his wife? You understand, said Holmes nicely, that I keep my other clients' secrets just like I will keep yours. Of course, that's right. I'm sorry. For my own case, I will give you any information that can help you understand what happened. Thank you. I know everything that is in the newspapers. I think I can learn more by asking you questions. Please ask. When did you first meet Miss Hattie Duran? I met her in San Francisco a year ago. Were you traveling in the States? Yes, yes. Did you get engaged then? No. But you were friendly? I enjoyed her company, and she knew that. Is her father very rich? People say he is the richest man in the area. And how did he get his money? From mining. He had nothing a few years ago. Then he found gold, invested it, and became very rich very quickly. What do you think about the young lady's character? Your wife's character? The nobleman moved his glasses faster and looked at the fire. You see, Mr. Holmes, he said. My wife was twenty before her father became rich. During that time, she lived freely in a mining camp and explored the woods and mountains. Her education came more from nature than from school. In England, we would call her a tomboy. She is strong, wild and free, not controlled by traditions. She makes decisions quickly and is brave in following them. On the other hand, I wouldn't have married her if I didn't think she was a good person. I believe she can do great things and would hate anything bad. Do you have her photo? I brought this with me. He opened a small case and showed us a beautiful woman's face. It was a small painted picture, not a photo. The artist had made her black hair, big dark eyes, and lovely mouth look very nice. Holmes looked at it for a long time. Then he closed the case and gave it back to Lord St. Simon. Did the young lady come to London? And did you meet her again? Yes. Her father brought her here for the season. I met her a few times, became engaged to her, and now we're married. Did she bring a lot of money with her? A normal amount for my family. And you have that money now, since you're married? I haven't asked about it. That's normal. Did you see Miss Doran the day before the wedding? Yes, yes. Was she happy? Very happy. She talked about what we would do in the future. That's interesting. And on the wedding morning? She was very cheerful until after the ceremony. Did you notice any change in her then? Well, I saw the first signs that she could be a bit impatient. But it was a small thing and not important for the case. Please tell us anyway. It's not important. She dropped her flowers while walking to the vestry. They fell into a pew. A man gave them back to her and they seemed fine. But when I talked to her about it, she answered me shortly. In the carriage on the way home, she seemed too upset about such a small thing. Interesting. So there was a man in the pew. 
Were there other people in the church? Yes, the church was open, so some people were there. Was this man one of your wife's friends? No, not at all. I called him a gentleman, but he looked ordinary. I didn't pay much attention to him, but I think we're talking about things that aren't important. Lady St. Simon returned from the wedding less happy than before. What did she do when she went back to her father's house? I saw her talking to her maid. Who is her maid? Her name is Alice. She is American and came from California with my wife. A private servant? A bit too close, I think. Her boss let her do many things. But in America, they think differently about these things. How long did she talk to Alice? Just a few minutes. I had other things to think about. Did you hear what they said? Lady St. Simon said something about jumping a claim. She often used slang like that. I don't know what she meant. American slang can be very clear sometimes. What did your wife do after talking to her maid? She went into the breakfast room. Did she go with you? No, she went alone. She liked to do small things by herself. Then, after sitting for about ten minutes, she quickly got up, said sorry, and left the room. She never came back. But this maid, Alice, says that she went to her room, put a long coat over her wedding dress, wore a hat, and went out. Yes, that's right. She was later seen walking in Hyde Park with Flora Miller, a woman now in custody who had already caused trouble at Mr. Dorian's house that morning. Ah, I see. I'd like some details about this young lady and your relationship with her. Lord St. Simon moved his shoulders and raised his eyebrows. We have been friends for some years, very good friends. She used to be at the Allegro. I have been kind to her and she had no reason to complain about me. But women can be difficult, Mr. Holmes. Flora is a nice girl, but has a strong temper and likes me a lot. She sent me terrible letters when she found out I was getting married. To be honest, I had a quiet wedding because I was worried she might cause trouble in the church. She came to Mr. Doran's door after we got back, tried to get in and said bad things about my wife, even threatening her. But I thought she might do something like that, so I had two police officers there in normal clothes who made her leave. She became quiet when she saw there was no point in making trouble. Did your wife hear all this? No, thank goodness she didn't. And she was seen walking with this woman later? Yes. Mr. Lestrade from Scotland Yard thinks this is very serious. They think Flora tricked my wife into going out and set a trap for her. That's possible. Do you think so too? I didn't say it's likely, but do you think it's likely? I don't think Flora would hurt anyone. Still, jealousy can change people. What do you think happened? Well, I came to hear your thoughts, not to give mine. I've told you all the facts. But since you ask, it's possible that the excitement of getting married and moving up in society made my wife nervous. So you think she became suddenly not well? Well, it's hard to explain her actions any other way, especially since she left so much behind that others wanted but never got. Well, that's also possible, said Holmes, smiling. Now, Lord Saint-Simon, I think I have almost all the information I need. Can I ask if you were sitting at the breakfast table in a position to see out the window? We could see the other side of the road and the park. OK, then I don't think I need to keep you here any longer. I'll contact you. If you are lucky enough to solve this problem, said our client, standing up. I have solved it. What? What did you say? 
I said that I have solved it. Where is my wife, then? I'll give you that detail soon. Lord St. Simon shook his head. I'm afraid it will take smarter people than you or me, he said, and left with a polite, old-fashioned bow. It's nice of Lord St. Simon to say my head is as good as his, said Sherlock Holmes, laughing. After all these questions, I think I'll have a drink and a cigar. I had already figured out the case before our client came in. My dear Holmes, I have notes on similar cases, although none were as quick. My whole investigation confirmed my guess. Sometimes, clues from situations can be very convincing, like when you find a fish in milk, as Thoreau said. But I've heard everything you've heard. But you don't know about the other cases that helped me. There was a similar case in Aberdeen a few years ago, and another one in Munich after the Franco-Prussian War. It's one of those cases. But wait, here's Lestrade. Good afternoon, Lestrade. There's an extra glass on the side table, and cigars. In the box. In the box. The detective was wearing a jacket and tie that made him look like a sailor, and he had a black canvas bag in his hand. He said hello, sat down, and lit the cigar he was given. What's happening? Asked Holmes, a sparkle in his eye. You don't look happy. I'm not. It's this confusing St. Simon wedding case. I can't understand it. Really? That's surprising. Who has ever heard of such a strange case? Every clue slips through my fingers. I've been working on it all day. You look wet, said Holmes, touching the arm of the jacket. Yes, I've been searching the serpentine. Why? Why? To find Lady St. Simon's body. Sherlock Holmes leaned back in his chair and laughed loudly. Have you looked in the Trafalgar Square fountain? He asked. Why? What do you mean? Because you have the same chance of finding her in either place. Lestrade looked angry at my friend. I guess you know everything? He said with a sneer. I just heard the facts, but I've made up my mind. Really? So you think the serpentine has nothing to do with it? I think it's very unlikely. Then maybe you can explain why we found this in it. He opened his bag and a wet wedding dress, white shoes, and a bride's veil and flowers fell out. Here, he said, putting a new wedding ring on top of the pile. There's a little problem for you to solve, Mr. Holmes. Oh, really? said my friend making blue smoke circles in the air. You got them from the serpentine? No. A park keeper found them floating near the edge. They were identified as her clothes, and I thought if the clothes were there, the body wouldn't be far away. Using that logic, every person's body can be found near their clothes. And what did you hope to learn from this? to find evidence that Flora Miller is involved in the disappearance. I think that will be hard. Really? said Lestrade, sounding upset. Holmes, I don't think you're very practical with your guesses. You've made two mistakes already. This dress does connect Miss Flora Miller. And how? In the dress is a pocket. In the pocket is a card case. In the card case is a note. And here's the note. He put it on the table in front of him. Listen, you will see me when all is ready. Come at once. F.H.M. I've always thought that Lady St. Simon was tricked by Flora Miller and that she and her friends were behind her disappearance. This note, signed with her initials, probably got to her at the door, and brought her to them. Very good, Lestrade, said Holmes, laughing. You're really great. Let me see it. He picked up the paper without much interest, 
But then he looked closely and said happily, "This is important." Really, you think so? Very much. I congratulate you. Lestrade stood up proudly and looked down. What? You're looking at the wrong side. No, this is the right side. The right side? You're crazy. The note is written in pencil here, and here is part of a hotel bill, which I find very interesting. There's nothing in it. I looked at it before," said Lestrade. October fourth, rooms eight shillings, breakfast two shillings, six pence, cocktail one shilling, lunch two shillings, six pence, glass sherry eight pence. I don't see anything special. You might not, but it's very important. The note is important too. Or at least the initials are. So I congratulate you again. I've wasted enough time," said Lestrade, standing up. "I believe in hard work, not sitting by the fire and making theories. Goodbye, Mister Holmes. Let's see who solves this first." He picked up the clothes, put them in the bag, and went to the door. "Just one hint for you, Lestrade." Said Holmes as his rival was leaving. I'll tell you the real answer. Lady Saint Simon is not real. There isn't, and there never was such a person. Lestrade looked sadly at my friend. Then he looked at me, tapped his forehead three times, shook his head seriously, and left. After he closed the door, Holmes got up to put on his coat. The man has a point about working outside. He said, "So, Watson, I think I'll leave you with your papers for a bit." It was after five when Sherlock Holmes left, but I wasn't alone for long. Within an hour, a man from the bakery came with a big flat box. He opened it with the help of a young man he brought with him, and to my surprise, they started setting up a small, fancy cold supper on our simple table. There were two cold woodcock birds, a pheasant, a special pie, and some old bottles with spider webs. After setting up all these nice foods, my two visitors left, like the magical beings in the Arabian Nights stories. They only said that the items were paid for and sent to this address. Just before nine, Sherlock Holmes came into the room quickly. His face was serious. But there was a sparkle in his eyes that made me think he was happy with his conclusions. They prepared the supper, then," he said, rubbing his hands. "You seem to be expecting guests. They set the table for five. Yes, I think we might have some visitors," he said. "I'm surprised Lord Saint Simon isn't here yet. Oh, I think I hear him coming up the stairs." It was indeed our guest from earlier who came in, moving his glasses more than before and looking very worried. My messenger found you," asked Holmes. "Yes, and the message surprised me a lot. Are you sure about what you say?" "I'm very sure." Lord Saint Simon sat in a chair and put his hand on his forehead. "What will the Duke think?" He said quietly, "When he hears one of the family had to deal with this embarrassment, it's just an accident. I don't think it's embarrassing. You see things differently. I don't think anyone is at fault. I can understand why the lady acted like she did, even if her way of doing it was too sudden. She didn't have a mother to help her in this difficult situation. It was a small insult, sir." A public insult," said Lord Saint Simon, tapping his fingers on the table. "You should be understanding of this poor girl in such a strange situation." "I won't be understanding. I'm very angry, and I've been treated badly." "I think I heard the doorbell," said Holmes. "Yes, someone is on the landing. If I can't make you see things in a nicer way, Lord Saint Simon." 
I have brought someone here who might be more successful. He opened the door and a man and woman came in. Lord St. Simon, let me introduce you to Mr. and Mrs. Francis Hay Moulton. I think you've met the lady before. When he saw the new people, our client stood up straight, looked down, and put his hand inside his coat, looking very upset. The lady took a quick step forward and held out her hand to him, but he still didn't look up. It was good for his decision, because her face was hard to say no to. You're angry, Robert, she said. Don't say sorry to me, said Lord St. Simon angrily. Oh, I know I treated you very badly and should have talked to you before I left. But I was confused, and from the moment I saw Frank here again, I didn't know what I was doing or saying. I'm surprised I didn't fall down and faint right there in front of the altar. Maybe, Mrs. Moulton, you want my friend and me to leave the room while you explain? If I can give my opinion, said the strange man, there's been too much secrecy about this already. I want everyone in Europe and America to hear the truth. He was a small, thin, tanned man, with no beard, a sharp face, and a quick way of acting. Then I'll start telling our story, said the lady. Frank and I met in 1984 in a camp near the big mountains where my father was working on some land. We fell in love and wanted to get married. But one day, my father found a lot of money, while Frank didn't have any luck. The richer my father became, the poorer Frank was, so my father didn't want us to marry anymore and took me to another city. Frank was very determined and followed me there. We decided that Frank would go and find his own fortune and we would wait for each other until he had as much money as my father. So we got married secretly, and Frank left to search for his luck. I heard that Frank went to different places, and then I read in the newspaper that he had been killed by a group of Indians. I felt very sad and was sick for a long time. My father thought I was not well and took me to many doctors. I didn't hear anything about Frank for more than a year, so I thought he was really dead. Then my father and I moved to London, and I was going to marry another man named Lord St. Simon. I didn't love him like I loved Frank, but I was ready to be a good wife to him. However, when I was at the church, I saw Frank in the first row. I was very surprised and didn't know what to do. He told me to be quiet and wrote a note for me. At first I thought he was a ghost, but when I looked again he was really there. He seemed to ask me if I was happy or sad to see him. I almost fainted and I couldn't focus on the wedding ceremony. I was wondering if I should stop the service and cause a scene in the church. But Frank seemed to know what I was thinking and told me to be quiet. That's when I saw him write a note for me. As I walked by his seat on my way out, I dropped my flowers to him, and he gave me the note when he returned the flowers. It was a short message asking me to join him when he signaled me. I knew my first duty was to him now, so I decided to follow whatever he wanted me to do. When I went back, I told my maid, who had known Frank in California and was his friend. I told her not to say anything, but to pack a few things and get my coat ready. I should have talked to Lord St. Simon, but it was very difficult in front of his mother and all the important people. I decided to run away and explain later. I saw Frank outside the window and followed him. A woman talked to me about Lord St. Simon and his secrets, but I left her and met Frank. We took a cab to his new home, and that was our real wedding after waiting for many years. Frank had been a prisoner escaped and followed me to England. I read about it in a newspaper. 
the American said. It mentioned the name in the church, but not where the lady lived. Frank and I talked about what to do next. I felt embarrassed and wanted to disappear, but Frank wanted to be open about everything. I was worried about everyone at the breakfast table waiting for me. Frank took my wedding clothes and things, made a bundle, and hid them so nobody could find them. We might have gone to Paris the next day, but Mr. Holmes found us and explained that Frank was right and I was wrong. He gave us a chance to talk to Lord St. Simon alone, so we came to his rooms immediately. I'm sorry if I hurt you, and I hope you don't think badly of me. Lord St. Simon looked serious and didn't change his strict posture. He listened to the story with a frown. Excuse me, he said, but I don't usually talk about my private life in public. So, you won't forgive me? You won't shake hands before I leave? Oh, of course, if it makes you happy. He held out his hand and shook hers coldly. I hoped, I hoped, said Holmes, that you would have joined us for a friendly dinner. I think you're asking too much, answered his lordship. I may accept these recent events, but I can't be expected to celebrate them. I will now wish you all a good night. He bowed to everyone and left the room. I trust that you'll join me, said Sherlock Holmes. It's always nice to meet an American, Mr. Moulton. I believe that one day our children will be citizens of the same worldwide country with a flag that combines the Union Jack and the Stars and Stripes. The case was interesting, said Holmes after our visitors left. It shows how simple an explanation can be for something that seems difficult to understand. The lady's story is very natural. But the result is strange when seen by someone like Mr. Lestrade from Scotland Yard. Were you not at fault at all, then? From the start, I knew two things. The lady was willing to get married, but changed her mind soon after. Something must have happened that morning to change her mind. She couldn't have talked to anyone, so she must have seen someone. This person must be from America, since she had only been in this country for a short time. We have already guessed that she saw an American. Who could this person be, and why did he have so much power over her? It could be a lover or a husband. Her past helped me understand the situation. When Lord Saint-Simon told his story, everything became clear. She had left with a man and the man was a lover or a previous husband. How did you find them? It could have been hard, but Lestrade had important information that he didn't know about. The initials were important, and it was even more useful to know that the man had recently paid his bill at a fancy London hotel. How did you know it was fancy? Because of the high prices. A hotel that charges so much must be one of the best. In the second hotel I visited, I found that an American man, Francis H. Moulton, had just left. I found his address and went there. I found the couple at home and gave them advice. I told them to be more clear about their situation and to talk to Lord St. Simon. I invited them to meet him here, and as you see, they came. But it didn't go very well, I said. He wasn't very kind. Ah, oh, Watson, Holmes smiled. Maybe you wouldn't be kind either if you lost your wife and money right after getting married. We can be gentle with Lord St. Simon and be glad we won't be in his position. Come sit and give me my violin. We need to find a way to spend these cold autumn evenings. The end. See you in the next videos.